Hey everyone, welcome to Keto and Crime. Today we've got the story of the miracle of the Andes. Even though this is still a tragedy beyond anything that I've ever really read about, um, it's also one of those unique situations where the ending is rather happy. It can even be considered rather uplifting. So we're going to talk about it, though this is not to downplay any of the people that died in this tragedy, the deaths, it's not to downplay that, but overall, this story ends with a feeling of hope, and even the survivors would, would tell you that. But basically what we're going to be talking about is the 1972 accident involving Uruguayan Airline uh, Air Force Flight 571. It was a Fairchild FH-227D, and uh, is the tragic tragedy of the airplane carrying a Uruguayan rugby team with uh, its the team, the crew, and passengers, some involved with the game, some not, that tragically through a series of very unfortunate decisions and events ended up crashing between Uruguay and Chile and ended up crashing and being trapped in the Andes Mountains, the snow-capped Andes Mountains, in winter of 1972, from October 13th through December 23rd. And so we're going to talk about the disaster, what happened. I'm going to intercut it with some clips from the uh, 1990s version of the story called Alive, starring Ethan Hawke. Uh, as campy as that sounds, it was actually a very good representation of what happened. And so with that being said, Let's dive into the Andes miracle, or the miracle of the Andes. As always, this video is brought to you by our brand new full channel partner, Keto Crisp. The wonderful folks over at TasteCanDo.com have officially signed on to partner with me in both my weight loss journey, which I am back on now, as well as sponsoring the channel. They have signed me up for a brand new affiliate program, so if you click the link down below, as well as put in my uh, discount code, you'll receive 15% off your first order, and I do get a tiny commission if you do purchase. So it helps the channel, and you get something tasty and healthy. These are great bars. They satisfy. They keep you full for a long time. They have a lot of great nutrients, a lot of great natural ingredients. And for those of us in the keto and low-carb world, we've often been demonized as a not a friend to the animals, uh, but these are 100% plant-based. So you can feel good about that too if you are of the vegetarian or vegan keto lifestyle. You, these are also for you. So with that being said, I want to say a huge shout out to Keto Crisp for sponsoring the channel and helping me to stay on the air here. And thank you all. So if you'd like to order some, definitely check them out below. I appreciate it. Oh, say. Let's go back to talk about what happened. We have a rugby team from the Old Christians Club Rugby Union that was scheduled to play the national team of Chile in Santiago. And as a result, the team chartered a Uruguayan Air Force flight to depart from Montevideo, Uruguay and arrive at Santiago, Chile in time for their game and then bring them back. So the flight was scheduled to depart Carrasco International Airport on Montevideo on October 12, 1972. Now remember I said this was a Fairchild. Fairchilds were fairly small aircraft. They didn't have the ability to fly very high, nor did they, did they have extreme composition uh, abilities to kind of maneuver around bad, bad flight patterns, bad airspace weather, 
whatever you want to talk about. And so I don't understand why this particular airplane was chartered, probably because it was available and probably less expensive than others, not saying that that was the primary reason why. It was just kind of a series of unfortunate events. Uh, October 12th, the plane carried 40 passengers, including a crew of five and a uh, the t members of the rugby team and their family. There was also an extra 10 seats available and a couple of them were actually purchased by people not in any way affiliated with the rugby team. For example, Graciela Marina, one of the unfortunate ones that did pass away, bought a seat so she could attend her oldest daughter's wedding. They departed uh, Montevideo, Uruguay on October 12th, 1972, but then a storm front prevented them from making the hop over the Andes mountain range into Chile. Um, they had to stop overnight in Mendoza, Argentina, and from there a series of unfortunate events took over. Remember I said that this type of airplane only had a flight ceiling of about 28,000 feet. Um, now the mountains that they were required to get over to get to Chile stood at about 26,000 feet. So not a lot of, you know, latitude there, so to speak. And also because it was fully loaded with supplies and baggage and people, it was training down. So you're probably actually looking at it having more of a limit closer to the height of the mountains, 26,000, 27,000 feet. Now also when they, after they parked overnight, they were going to depart the next day early morning. Weather conditions in the Andes get worse as time drives, drives on. So it would have made sense for them to be over the Andes mountains by 2 p.m. But that was not the case. They were uh, actually, because of a weather front, were delayed until actually departing at 2.18 p.m., well outside of that radius. I don't know why the pilot and co-pilot did not uh, heed the warnings, but they didn't. And with that being said, I'm going to hop over to kind of a better explanation of the route. Okay, so on October 12, 1972, our team of rugby players, uh, passengers, and friends and family of the teams departed Montevideo, Uruguay on their route to Santiago, Chile. However, the weather conditions that day were very bad over the Andes. A lot of wind, a lot of snow, a lot of visibility problems. So air traffic control forced them to land here at Mendoza, Argentina and stay the night. Now, Mendoza to Santiago is only uh, about 200 kilometers, which would have been barely an hour's flight over the Andes. The problem is the Andes mountain range requires the, would have required the Fairchild to fly at an altitude of 26,000 feet, which is very close to its maximum altitude. So this was a very dangerous flight with this type of plane. Still, they did stop overnight in Mendoza and left at approximately 2.38 p.m. on the 13th in 1972 to make the final little hop over to Santiago. The problem is that because of the weather and the fact that most people that did this sort of flying would recommend that this flight be made early morning to avoid a lot of the visibility problems that come with later in the day, still to avoid the, the weather to avoid everything that was coming at them, the pilot made the decision to leave too late. And he began what would have been a one hour trek over the Andes to finish the route to Santiago to play in the rugby match. Also, the veteran captain on board this ship was actually flying co-pilot that day because he was training a brand new pilot uh, who's actually technically the co-pilot, but they switched seats so that the captain could kind of guide him over. The captain, according to all, uh, all records and account, had flown over the Andes Mountains about 29 times. So he was an old veteran at this, but his co-pilot wasn't. And, but he allowed the co-pilot, even though they were leaving way too late in the day, which 
again compounds why didn't they stop why didn't they wait until and leave on the 14th i would rather have the game been later even been canceled than have this happen but yet they took they took off way too late and started their flight over the andes mountains into chile now their first uh point over from montevideo uruguay to Chile would have been the city of Carico, Caraco. Forgive me if I mispronounce that. But that is kind of the point where they start, where they, when they're over there, they know that they have cleared the mountains, that they are good to go and they can start a regular flight pattern. However, because of the co pilot's inexperience, he actually thought he was over Carico much sooner than, than he should have. And, misread the the instruments also because of the snow and the turbulence they mi literally misread their instruments now while this is going on you had a party on the plane the members of the rugby team were having a great old time partying throwing things and absolutely just living it up <laughs> The co-pilot, who's actually piloting the plane, uh, radioed Carico at 3.21 p.m. saying he would be there over their airspace within a minute. Of course, he never arrived. Uh, this is where they actually uh, misread the instruments and ended up colliding directly with the top of one of the mountains. Before the collision with the mountain, they started to descend way too fast. They dropped several hundred feet really quickly, and some of the survivors on the rugby team, that is Nando Parada and Roberto Canessa, reported at things flying around due to turbulence, and they were descending way too fast. It was at this point that the flight attendant ordered everybody to buckle in, and basically... When the pilots realized that they were much too close to the mountain, they began to turn and try to go up. They applied maximum power to gain altitude and clear the mountain. However, because of the limitations of the Fairchild, it was impossible, and they ended up slamming right into a mountain, which tore a huge hole in the fuselage of the plane. Now, you can imagine a hole has basically opened up in the plane. You start, you know, snow's coming in wind, things are flying around, and at one point the tail broke off of the plane and actually disappeared, sucking a tremendous amount of people out with it. Are we supposed to fly that close to the mountains? Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Bless her, the one woman, bless her, bless her. Uh, basically, the front part of the plane with half the fuselage is now in a 
downward trajectory and it actually hits the ground in Argentina. The last point in Argentina before you actually clear the Andes Mountains into Chile and actually slides down the mountain and comes to rest. When the fuselage came to rest, 33 people out of the 40 to 45 people on the aircraft, 40 passengers, 45 crew, were still alive. Among the dead were four that had been killed when the tail snapped off and they were sucked out. Others were killed on impact. And so you had 33 people alive in essentially a frozen tin can. Immediately upon impact, you had, uh, once it came to settle, you had some of the rugby team popping up and, of course, visibly shaken, as you can imagine, and starting to look around for their friends and family and started essentially digging people out of seats, finding some of the survivors, trying to figure out what happened. You had Roberto Canessa and Gustavo Zerbino, who were both first-year medical students, first-year medical school. Now, in South America, Europe, you go directly from high school to university and then pretty much into a medical program. So it's not like they had a bachelor's degree and that they were, you know, it's kind of a vocation there. So they were... Not saying they weren't qualified, they're very qualified, but it's not medical school as we would think here in North America. Uh, even though it is, they were training to be MDs. Please don't take it that way. Um, but they started assessing the people, and they realized most of the people that were alive had been severely injured, mostly because of the baggage falling and the seats literally coming unlatched and crushing people under it. Some of the more standout injuries were Nando Parada, who who would end up being one of the heroes of this whole saga, was out from a concussion. Uh, he was in a coma for about three days. We'll talk about that. His little sister also uh, was severely injured, and his mother died on impact. So you had this poor guy absolutely uh, in a coma that's going to wake up to probably the worst nightmare that anybody could wake up to. You also had Enrique Palert Platorio that had a piece of metal from the plane skewered into his abdomen. You had others, uh, members of the team with broken legs, uh, broken arms, concussions, just generally suffering from exposure. And Canessa actually took care of the young man with the, with the skewering by simply getting his attention and ripping it right out of him. Literally, he just said there was only one thing he could do. He got his attention to something else and just jerked it out of him. So this is very much wilderness uh, medicine here that they're having to, to practice. Meanwhile, both Chilean uh, Rescue and Argentina have started a full-scale search because they lost this plane on radar. But unfortunately, because of the weather and the fact that the... Um, plane was light colored kind of blended in with the snow unfortunately during the first few days of the search Knessa, who was the captain of the team natural leader started putting people together to do certain jobs he had people take the covers off the seats to create blankets and pillows for the wounded and just for them all because he knew it was going to get cold he had people go outside, remove, pick up any luggage they could find, and attempt to write SOS with both lipstick and the suitcases on the snow in hopes that somebody would see them. He also had them look through the luggage to find any sort of provisions, which we will get to. Um, he and some other survivors went up front to check on the pilot. Um, they found everybody but the co-pilot, the one actually flying the plane, dead in the in the cockpit. Um, he was cr crushed by the control panel. There was no way he was going to live and he actually asked them to find his gun so that he could commit suicide. And they would not, they said they just couldn't do that. These were all very staunch practicing Catholics. So euthanasia was out of the question. 
they would not put him out of his misery, nor would they allow him to shoot himself. They also found the engineer and the mechanic uh, when they saw that the radio was still intact, and they asked, can this be saved? But unfortunately, the radio operator was a little out of his gourd and basically told them that, yes, it would work if they had batteries, but the batteries were in the tail. Tail is gone. Do you have any signal flares? No. Emergency supplies? <laughs> Nothing like that. What's wrong with him? What's wrong with you? What about the radio? What about the radio? Can it be made to work? God, not without batteries! Well, are there batteries or not? Uh, the batteries are in the tail and the... The tail's gone! <laughs> So, when they took accounts of what they had from the suitcases and stuff they could find, they had eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three small jars of jelly or jam, a tin of almonds, some dried dates, some other candies, some dried plums, and several bottles of wine, as well as quite a few packages of cigarettes. That's literally all they had. So, um, Canessa, Roberto Canessa, started rationing it. Each day, he would give them a cup a lid, cup of wine, and a square of chocolate. That was their rations because they had no idea how long they were going to be there. Also, they started looking for clothes so they could dress warmly. They also took to stacking the suitcases in the uh, opening created when the tail fell off to try to keep the weather out. Each day when they woke up, more and more people were dead, either from exposure, freezing to death, or just dying of their injuries. They did things like they could for the ones that were severely injured with leg injuries. They created hammocks, hung them above so they wouldn't be on the floor with their injuries. They did everything they could do to alleviate the suffering of these people. Uh, Nando Parada woke up three days later and realized that both his mom was dead and that his sister Susanna Parada would probably not survive the night. And she did not, unfortunately. And then he said he was going to find a way back to his father. And he was the first one to even talk about cannibalism because he said, I'll cut some meat off the pilots. They're the ones that got us into this mess. Everybody just thought, oh, he's just mad. But it was foreshadowing. Y'all. As days turned into weeks, they realized that their rations were severely low. No one had come. They saw an airplane momentarily that dipped its wing and they thought maybe they were going to be rescued, but it turned out not to be. So, Canessa brought up the idea of actually eating the dead. Now, at this point, there are only men and one woman uh, surviving. Uh, this Liliana Methol was there with her husband. She was the only surviving woman. She functioned as kind of the mom, the den mom to everyone. Everybody loved her. She tried to keep their spirits up. Um, but when the idea of eating people, the dead bodies, came up, she was staunchly against it and said she would not condemn anyone else for doing it, but she wasn't going to do it. And they kind of went back and forth for several days, but they realized they had no food. They were going to starve. Nothing could grow on this mountain. There were no animals to hunt. They had no choice. So they decided to look at it as if God had provided. So Nando and did specify that no one would eat his mom or his sister and he put those bodies aside and they all respected him for that. Uh, respected his decision on that. Uh, Caressa and Zerbinio, the two medical students, were the ones that decided that they would be the ones to cut the meat. So they went over to where some of the bodies were frozen in the snow they cleaned away enough snow to see a leg and they cut match stick sizes size pieces of flesh and put them on top of the plane to dry uh, once they were dry they told everyone to get one and eat it they did and they would wash it down with fresh snow in the meantime they're also not only eating snow except where they've designated to urinate and defecate but they also have put snow on pieces of metal from the plane to allow it to melt into 
actual water. So they're starting to eat the flesh, and over the next few weeks and days, they eat everything except maybe vital organs, uh, even though um, Knessa suggested that they do because of the vitamin content, uh, several of the bodies. Um, as someone died, they were taken out and put into the snow. They didn't know who they were eating. They kept the faces covered. And then a few days later, midnight, October 29th, an avalanche struck the struck the aircraft when they were sleeping and filled it with, it killed another eight people, including Liliana Methoff, who It's still not eaten anything. Uh, they mourned her extremely, and uh, they also designated that her body would not be eaten out of respect because she was such a saintly figure to them. Uh, they managed to dig people out. Uh, they managed to dig the fuselage out, and but some of the bodies that they were eating were lost to the avalanche. But fortunately, they had new bodies to replace them, I suppose. And um, they decided to, if they stayed here, if they just remained here and didn't, did nothing, that they would eventually die. So it was decided that Knessa, Nando, and one other would strike up the mountain to see if they could see help and possibly even find the tail to see if there was more supplies there. So for the next week, Knessa, Nando, Numa, Tarchetti, and Antonio Visitine were chosen for trekking over the mountain. They were spared the manual labor, they were given the best food, and they had food, and they were given the best clothes, the best socks, they made makeshift snowshoes for them out of the metal and stuff that they had, and they gave them a week to rest up and get ready. Uh, they hoped that they could actually make it into Chile. So they started the huge um, task of trying to get over the mountain on November 15th. After several hours of walking over the mountain, they found the tail section of the aircraft. Uh, they found some chocolates, three meat patties, some rum, cigarettes, extra clothes, comic books, and some medicine, like painkillers. And they also found the radio. So it was decided that they would camp there at the tail that night and then the next day they would send somebody back with the stuff that they had found and they one of they did spend the night in front of a fire reading comic books they continued east next morning and then on the second night which was their first night sleeping out in the elements without a section of the plane to protect them 
they nearly froze to death. And the next morning, it was decided that instead of the four of them proceeding, it would be wiser to return to the tail, take the batteries, and bring them back. So they went back to the tail, they gathered up everything, and they went back to the main section of the plane, but it was found out that after several days of tinkering with the radio, it would not work. But what they did here is that the search had been called off. I can't imagine uh, what kind of darkness that put over the group, but they did hear that. So uh, it was decided they would try again. In the meantime, three more people had died, including Arturo, Noloria, Rafael, Echeverian, and they died of actually infection, uh, gangrene to some of their, the, their broken legs and the people that were hoisted above in the hammocks, as well as Numa Tarkati, who had been among the first rescue team. He would not eat uh, the meat from people. He just couldn't bring himself to do it, and he actually died December 11th, weighing only 55 pounds. They knew they had to try one more time. So with that being said, they started making uh, a huge sleeping bag out of seat covers, clothing, that would hopefully allow a trek team to be able to survive the elements. And then it was decided, and then on December 12th, the same team, minus Trichetti, who is now deceased, started out again to see if they could make it to Chile. Uh, on December 12th, they hiked high into the mountains. They still, because of the pilot, and I don't understand why they're even listening to these pilots, uh, they thought they were closer to Carrico than they actually were, and they'd only brought three days' worth of food with them. Uh, but as a result, they were, of course, a lot further away than they thought. Uh, they were each wearing multiple layers of clothes, socks, and then as they started to get higher into the mountain, uh, breathing became an issue because you're in much higher altitude. Uh, but they continued to persevere, and by the second day, they had made it to the top of one of the ranges, and they could see over, all they could see was more mountains. And of course, uh, kind of discouraged, but Knessa, honestly, looking down at the mountain range, thought he saw less snow than he had on some of the nearby mountain ranges, and also thought he actually saw a hiking path or a road that led further into the uh, mountains. Uh, Nando and him got into an argument about what they should do. Uh, they were debating between going on and turning back. Finally, it was decided that not knowing how far they were away from civilization, they basically sent Byzantine back down to the crash site to, to let them know that Nando and Canessa were going on, and they actually made a make, makeshift sled out of an old airline seat, and he actually slid down the mountain back towards the camp and got there in like one or two hours instead of having to trek all the way back, because it was, you know, mainly downhill. Uh, so basically, over the next three hours, Nando and Canessa continued to climb to the summit of the mountain they were on. When they reached the top, they saw more mountains, still with less snow, but they, you know, they were like, okay, we're dead. But then they decided they have no choice but just to continue on. So they continued on and over, and they eventually did get to that trail or that road that they thought they saw. And it actually was a trail and a road, and they eventually started walking along it. As they walked deeper in, they begin to see green vegetation, running water, and signs of humanity in that they saw aluminum cans, tin cans, litter. I mean, let you know you're alive, I suppose. And after several more days, they finally reached the snow line and kind of a raging river. And they saw cows. Cows. I might have killed one of those cows, I'm just saying. But... They decided to make a fire for the night, 
they had been traveling now nine days. Nine days on three days worth of, well, you know the food that they're eating. While they were building their fire, uh, they happened to look up and see a man on horseback across the river. And they began signaling to him, asking them to help him. And he shouted back to them, tomorrow, and then left. And then the next day, he was back. And he wrote something on a piece of paper, tied it to a rock, and threw it over the, over the river with a pencil attached to it, and basically told him who he was. They wrote down their reply and threw it back, and this is what they wrote. I have come from a flame that fell into the mountains. I am Uruguayan. We have been walking for ten days. I have a wounded friend up there. In the plane, there are still fourteen injured people. We have to get them here quickly. We don't know how. We cannot even walk. Where are we? Sergio Catalan, the man, was essentially a Chilean cowboy. He read the note, gave them a sign he understood, and basically uh, sent them over some uh, bread, threw through them over a couple of loaves of bread, and then he rode horseback for 10 hours to bring them help. Um, basically, a rescue team found them, and then they were taken to get received medical help, and then they went back later on to take a rescue team to the rest of the survivors by helicopter. After the rescue, it was determined through medical examinations that the survivors had lost essentially half their body weight. Many of them were way under 100 pounds. And they were very, very hesitant to tell people how they had stayed alive. But eventually, the story of their cannibalism came out, and people took it kind of the same way they portrayed it to themselves as God taking care of them. Um, they held a press conference on December 28, 1972, and they recounted the entire events of the 72 days they were in the mountains. Um, they kind of thanked God. They thanked their family. Um, and basically, the 14 survivors were reunited with their family. Um, and a few days after... In January 1973, after the storms had subsided, they, a crew went back into the uh, Andes and buried the remains of the aircraft and the body and erected a cross to mark the spot. And that is the story uh, of the miracle of the Andes. It was a miracle. If they had not taken matters into their own hands, they would have probably already, they would have all died up there. But thanks to human perseverance, human human need to survive, they made it. And I thought this was a very, very uh, uplifting story, even though it's horrible, it's still uplifting, and my heart goes out to every single person that died in that plane and their family. But I'm also happy for those that were reunited and survived. And there is a museum uh, to this miracle in Montevideo, Uruguay. If you ever get down there, I'm sure it's worth seeing. And uh, the plaque that they erected on a pile of rocks for the survivors reads, The world to its Uruguayan brothers, O oh, cl close, O oh God, to you. And, uh, yeah, that's the story of the Miracle of the Andes. Hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, keep on crying.